Good day, everyone. Welcome to the 11th webinar in the series hosted by the IEA Greenhouse Gas R&D Programme, or IEA GHG, as it is more generally known. My name is Keith Bernard. I'm a project manager at IEA GHG. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to spend a few minutes briefly introducing the program. The IEA GHG, which was, for, which was established in 1991, is one of the International Energy Agency's technology collaboration programs. It plays an important role in the IEA's energy technology network. We have 32 members from 18 countries who meet twice a year to set the strategic direction and decide upon the technical program. IEA GHG technical reports are used by policymakers, regulators, and industry. They are technically focused rather than being policy pres prescriptive, with responsibility for policy being more the domain of our alm alma mater, the International Energy Agency. While our remit is to look at all greenhouse gas mitigation options, our current focus is on carbon capture and storage technologies, with a watching brief on alternative options. Through our reports, networks, conferences and webinars, we disseminate the latest research and results on CO2 capture, transport, regulation and storage. Our research is published through technical reports, reviews and information papers, all of which is freely available, free of charge to anyone within a member country or organization, and can be accessed very easily from our website. Through our involvement with international bodies, such as the UNFCCC, the European Commission, the CSLF, and OPEC, with industry groupings such as the CIAB, and attendance annually at COP meetings, our, techn our technical information is made widely available to policymakers and industry to assist all parties in coming to informed decisions. Here you can see a breakdown of our membership. It comprises representation from two international bodies and 15 countries and 15 members drawn from research and industry. We expect all of these, plus many more, many, many more to be represented at GHGT 13, our biennial conference to be held next month in Lausanne, Switzerland, from 14th to 18th of November. GHGT 13 is the preeminent global conference dealing with CCS. I mentioned our networks earlier. Before we begin today's webinar, I should briefly introduce the one focused on costs. The IEA GHG cost net network was officially inaugurated in 2014. As you know, one of the key barriers to the wide-scale application of CCS is cost. Since 2011, IEA GHG has been part of a steering committee that has helped to organize a series of international two-day workshops on the cost of CCS. Our speakers today are important members of the cost network steering committee and will add a little more on the network during their presentation. Now to the webinar entitled CCS Cost Trends and Outlook. We have two distinguished speakers presenting to you today. They need a little introduction to many of you active in this topic. First we will hear from Howard Herzog. Howard is a senior research en engineer in the MIT Energy Initiative. He received his undergraduate and graduate education in chemical engineering at, M at MIT. He has industrial experience with Eastman Kodak, Stone and Webster, Aspen Technology, and Spectrophysics. Since 1989, he has been on the MIT research staff where he works on sponsored research involving energy and the environment with an emphasis on greenhouse gas mitigation technologies. He was a coordinating lead author for the IPCC special report on carbon dioxide capture and storage. He's a co-author on the MIT Future of Coal study, 
and a U.S. delegate to the CSLS technical group from June 2003 to September 2007. He was awarded the 2010 Green Man Award for, uh, by the IEHGHG in recognition of contributions made to the development of greenhouse gas control technologies. Howard will be followed by our second speaker, Edward Rubin. Ed is alumni chair of environmental engineering and science and professor of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. He was a founding member of the engineering and public policy department and founding director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Studies and the Environmental Institute. He is a fellow member of ASME, recipient of the CMU Distinguished Pro Professor of Engineering Award for Outstanding Achievements in Engineering Research, Education and Public Service, and recipient of the AWMA Lyman A. Ripperton Award for Distinguished Achievements as an Educator. Ed has served on advisory committees to various state and federal government agencies, including the USDOE, the US EPA, the State of California Energy Commission, Air, Resor Air Resources Board, and Public Utility Commission. He is a national associate member of the National Academies and serves regularly on its boards and study committees. Among his international activities, he was a coordinating lead author for the IPCC and as such a co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, an advisor to the Alberta Energy Ministry of Canada and is currently a board member of the UK CCS Research Centre. Now just a reminder before we begin, during the webinar, if you have any questions, please send them to us via the webinar link. There should be a checkbox on your screen. Time permitting, the speakers will address them at the conclusion of the presentation. So with that, over to you, Howard. Okay, hello everybody. It's uh, good to, uh, uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Keith, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, talk about um, uh, CCS costs. Let me just get the screen set up. Okay, I'm ready to go. Um, what we're going to talk about today, as uh, Keith said, are CCS cost trends and outlook. Uh, once again, Keith went over this uh, briefly, a little more detail of how this whole process got started and leading to the cost network. Uh, it actually started with a, 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 some initial discussions with a group of people, about 20 or 30 of us, back in uh, uh, 2010, uh, saying that uh, at that time, uh, we did all this work in the IPCC special report about cost. We thought we had it uh, down well, but the, the second half of that uh, decade, uh, the first decade of the century, cost sort of, uh, Lots of changes came to cost, and we were sort of confused of what CCS really cost at that point, and we decided to go ahead with a series of uh, ad hoc workshops. Uh, three of them were held, two at the IA in Paris and one at Epriot in Palo Alto. We said these workshops uh, uh, were very uh, informative. We felt they were very useful. We wanted to uh, make them more formal, so uh, we worked with IEA Greenhouse Gas uh, during this time and we said let's formally become a, a network and uh, we did that in 2014 and, and the link to the network web uh, site is uh, there, you can see on the screen. We've uh, held an additional workshop here at MIT uh, earlier this year and uh, uh, right now we're planning a workshop uh, uh, tentatively for uh, London at Imperial College in September 2017. The proceedings of the uh, first four workshops are available. I've given the link uh, through one of my websites and I think they're on uh, some other organization websites as well. Uh, but with this link uh, you can go ahead and, and look at some of that work. 
What we're going to talk about today are uh, changes in CCS costs over the past 10 years, basically from the time the uh, special report was done in 2005 to when uh, we presented a paper last year in, in 2015, and that paper will form the basis uh, of our discussion. We'll also look at the outlook for future costs and what it may take to achieve these cost reductions. Uh, as I said, uh, the starting point for a lot of this is the IPC special report where both uh, Ed and I uh, worked on, and it was one of the first comprehensive look uh, at CCS. Uh, the, the report was one of the first comprehensive look at CCS, the climate change mitigation. Nine chapters, uh, about 100 authors uh, were involved. Um, and as one of the chapter, one, well, throughout the report we talked about cost and uh, and looked at estimates for CO2 capture, transport, and storage options. Uh, the way that it worked was in each of the uh, individual chapters, say on the capture chapter, they would look at capture costs, and the transport chapter, they look at transportation costs. Ed was very uh, active in the in the in getting the capture costs done in, in uh, chapter three, the capture chapter. And this is uh, shows uh, some of the information that came out uh, in that uh, chapter. You can see uh, we start with uh, performance parameters such as emission rates and uh, capture efficiency, energy requirements, etc. Uh, we also looked at cost, including uh, capital cost, uh, the uh, levelized cost of electricity, and we also looked at uh, uh, mitigation cost as uh, uh, in units of cost of CO2 avoided. So I'm not going to go into details here. We'll look at some of these numbers in, in context later. But this just shows some of the uh, uh, cost metrics uh, uh, that were involved. Once again, we just focused on cost. Some of the things we're discussing in the uh, cost network now are go beyond cost and what's the value of CCS, but that's beyond the uh, discussion today. Uh, then. What we did in uh, the chapter I was involved in, chapter eight on the economics, we gathered all the costs from throughout the reports and put them together and, and into the system and, and tried to see what the, uh, the cost would be. And, and the most uh, important thing here, we looked at uh, two key metrics, uh, what impact uh, CCS had on levelized costs of electricity and what uh, the mitigation cost was, once again, in terms of CO2 uh, avoided. Uh, you can see here we looked at it for both geologic storage and uh, what happens if you have uh, uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, uh, storage as well. The, uh, as I said, a lot had happened since the, that original report. Uh, and uh, and not just in cost, but a lot of things in CCS. The IA Greenhouse uh, Gas Program, which uh, uh, runs uh, or is the editors of the uh, International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control, uh, made a special issue 10 years after the special report. Uh, uh, lots of topics, and one of the topics uh, was the cost of CO2 capture and storage. Uh, Ed and I were co-authors of that report, along with John Davison from the IEA Greenhouse Gas Program. Um, and what we're going to talk, present today are some of the results that are, are in that report, so you can always refer to that report uh, for more details. Um, the cost update, what we did was we said, let's take a look at the cost and let's look at recent uh, major studies of cost. Uh, and most of these studies, in fact, the, the studies all came from U.S. and Europe, uh, um, and they uh, looked at three different types of uh, capture costs. We, we looked at post-combustion with both supercritical coal-fire power plants and natural gas combined cycle plants. Uh, we looked at pre-combustion capture with IGCC plants and oxy-combustion capture from supercritical pulverized coal plants. Uh, the original um, uh, special report did not include oxy-combustion, so oxy-combustion was uh, do we add on here? Uh, we adjusted all the costs in these studies to 2013 dollars. We also went back to the uh, special report and updated their cost estimates uh, uh, from 2002 dollars to 2013 dollars. Uh, and we used separate cost escalation factors for uh, uh, the capital and OM cost uh, for, and the separate ones for uh, fuel cost uh, in the escalation. I'll show that in the next couple slides. And finally, uh, 
uh, we compared these values to the uh, more recent cost uh, and see how they compared. Uh, the studies we used, there were 16 studies. Each of these studies had uh, multiple cases. Uh, the studies came from organizations like the DOE, the, the uh, DOE and the National Energy Technology Laboratory from EPRI, uh, from the uh, Global CCS Institute, from the Zero Emissions Program in Europe, from the IEA Greenhouse Gas Program. Uh, so they're all major studies uh, looking fairly detailed at uh, uh, cost of CCS. When we looked across the, and some of the assumptions in these more recent studies from the past studies, uh, we saw it was the, the, the special report and the recent studies were fairly consistent in their um, uh, design parameters uh, such as uh, the CO2 emissions rates, the capture rates, the plant efficiencies, and so that was fairly consistent over time. However, we saw lots of things that changed. Uh, one thing that changed was the size that we're considering the studies and the size of these plants arose anywhere from between 10 to 25 percent on average uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, plant capacity factors were also, and these studies were also greater than the ones used in the special report uh, by about uh, 10 percentage points for pulverized coal plants. Uh, also, the fixed charge rate factor, the, basically the cost of capital was lowered. Uh, uh, in the uh, more recent studies compared to the special report. And the parameter study values in these new studies offer different for plants with and without CCS where they were more consistent uh, in the special report. And we also saw an increased focus on the potential for CO2 utilization, uh, especially the uh, CO2 uh, enhanced oil recovery. The uh, Capital cost trends that uh, happened over this time, you can see here, the green line on this graph is the uh, U.S. Consumer Price Index. The, uh, uh, basically, uh, the, 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 the inflation here in the U.S. And then these are uh, uh, U.S., but uh, things in the world are, are very similar. Uh, we have the Chemical Engineering Plant Cost Index in orange here. And we can see that went up uh, faster than the uh, um, consumer price index. A, po a lot of this was due to the uh, uh, rapid activities in China uh, using a lot of um, uh, resources, steel and concrete and uh, labor and engineering firms uh, 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 that rose the price uh, throughout the world greater than just the uh, consumer price index. And finally, we see uh, uh, the uh, power plant capital cost index from uh, IHS CERA. They just looked at uh, power plants and how they uh, um, escalated. And uh, uh, they had uh, two indices, one including nuclear, one without. We used one that excluded nuclear. And we can see that this rose even higher than the chemical engineering plant cost index. And this is the one we use to um, update our numbers. Uh, this was the index we used to uh, 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 update numbers from the from the special report up to uh, 2013 dollars. And finally, uh, this is just an example of the uh, fuel cost for the U.S. We also had similar ones, uh, or we had ones for Europe also that we used. And you can see here once again a very significant change. A, uh, a gradual increase of coal price, but a very uh, significant decrease in, in gas price, and of course the, uh, the the price of the coal to gas price ratio uh, uh, just changing dramatically and, and having significant effects on, uh, on the different costs. Uh, the European uh, trends are a little different. They show bigger increases for both coal and natural gas. They do not see the drop in the natural gas prices we see here in the U.S. So these are some of the inputs, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ed, and he's going to talk about uh, some of the results uh, uh, from the more recent study and how they compared with the special report. Okay. Thanks very much, Howie. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, let's see. Let me switch back over. Uh, First, uh, let me uh, add my thanks to all of you. Uh, uh, it looks like we have 101 people online. I wish I could see all your faces. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, let me pick up with uh, uh, the 
results that came out of this comparison that Howard talked to you about. Uh, what we tried to do in the update is follow uh, pretty much the same method that we used in the special report uh, 10 years earlier. Uh, so here's another eye chart that uh, you can look at in uh, more detail. But basically, we tried to replicate the same kinds of information across the set of studies. Uh, as we did in the special report, uh, we uh, present the range of results uh, across the set of studies. Different assumptions apply in different situations, so one size does not fit all. Uh, and then we also reported what we call a representative value. Uh, often it was kind of an average or median value of the range of results that, uh, uh, that we, uh, we reported. As in the special report, we focused on three principal systems. Those were post-combustion on uh, coal and natural gas, pre-combustion with IGCC. Um, we also did a more extensive analysis of oxy-combustion, which had been treated uh, very lightly in the special report since there was not much activity at, uh, at that time. So let me uh, uh, try to get some highlights. What I want to do is these last two columns uh, uh, talk about the changes in representative values between the recent studies and the earlier studies. Uh, and in the next couple of slides, let me uh, focus on uh, some of those differences, which is represented by some of the numbers in, uh, in the lower right side of, of the screen. So let me start with one example. Let's just focus on uh, pulverized coal combustion plants uh, and see how recent studies compare to the earlier studies. So here's three sets of bar graphs. The first uh, numbers, and what we're showing here is just the total capital cost of uh, entire power plants uh, with and without uh, CCS. Uh, so on the left side are the results from the special report uh, as they appeared in 2002 dollars. Uh, the middle bar adjusts those numbers to 2013 dollars using the various indices that Howard just described to you. Uh, and the last bars on the right uh, show results from uh, the set of recent studies that, uh, that we looked at. Again, these are the representative values of, of the cost ranges. Um, so a couple of things uh, stand out. Uh, <coughs> let me focus on uh, the uh, uh, middle and right-hand bars, which is basically the comparison in, uh, in same year dollars. Uh, in the special report, the uh, plant with capture uh, had a capital cost that was about 63% higher than the reference plant without capture. Uh, in the more recent studies, uh, that difference is somewhat larger, a uh, 75% difference uh, in uh, the various studies that, uh, that we looked at. Um, if we also uh, compare uh, the plants without capture recently and uh, 10 years ago, the two blue bars in the middle, uh, and then compare the two orange bars. Again, what we see are uh, higher capital costs uh, in, both, in both cases. Uh, the fact that even without capture, these recent costs are higher suggests that, uh, at least in, in this technology, uh, the index that we used, which was the most aggressive of the several we had a choice of, uh, may, not be, uh, may not have captured all of the increases. We're seeing uh, somewhat higher increases, around 28% uh, without capture, and with capture, uh, a slightly uh, higher difference. So the message here is that in recent studies, in general, even accounting for general uh, inflation and escalation, real escalation, uh, capital costs are somewhat higher now than uh, they were 10 years ago. Here's another comparison now. Um, in this slide, we're looking at three different systems. So now we're, we're looking at supercritical PC, gasification combined cycle, and natural gas combined cycle with post-combustion. Uh, and what we're showing in this slide is the added capital cost for CO2 captures, the difference in capital cost between the plants with and without capture. Um, Again, the uh, lighter color uh, is, uh, uh, is the value from the special report. The darker color uh, is the value from, from the recent uh, studies. Uh, what we see across all three technologies 
uh, are significantly higher capital costs. We already saw it for supercritical PC. We see the same general trend for the other two technologies that are shown here, roughly 50% uh, higher uh, now than, than there would be. Uh, why would that be, and uh, does it uh, uh, make sense? Would it be unexpected? Uh, my take home is that uh, it's actually consistent with uh, what generally happens when newer technologies come out of the early stages of development and uh, begin to deploy, be deployed at scale. Many of you may have seen Hi, Ed. Ed, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Keith Bernard. I'm not sure that we have your slides on screen. Oh. Well, hello, Ed. Uh, we we, yes. we can't we can't currently see your slides on the screen. Well, hang on. Let me uh, try to do that. Okay. Um, it says show my screen. Yeah. Are you seeing it now? No. No one can see the screen. No. Start screen sharing. Hang on. Well, this is very. Okay. Uh, I'm Sorry. Picking a button. Ed, can I can I suggest that uh, if you carry on talking, I'll, I'll bring the screen back to mine where I've got the screens. Uh, I've got the slides on screen. Okay. And if you just let me know when you need the next one, we'll uh, click on. For the next Very slide. Good. Okay, so uh, if nobody has been seeing any of these to date, um, should we go back? Well, I, I was clicking on the button that said share screen. Let's try it one more time. How's that? No? Nope. Uh, I uh, want to go back to. Pulled it back to us as a presenter. I can. Try one more time, Ed. Okay. Show my screen. Yeah. Are you seeing anything now? No, that's still not coming through. So I think if we come okay. back, back to my screen, you keep talking. So and why don't we go? <coughs> why don't we go back to slide? Uh, Fifteen. Okay. About fifteen, seventy. Yeah, I messed up. Yeah. Right. Can you give me the title of that slide, please? Uh, fifteen would be added COE. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me go back. Uh, fifteen would be added capital cost for CO2 capture. There we are. So there you are. That's on screen now. So if you talk and just let me know when you need the next screen up, we'll slide up, we'll do that for you. And apologies for the, the technical errors. Okay. Uh, hang on. Let me see if I can get back to see what you're doing. A couple of these have some animation, uh, so I'd have to tell you to hit, uh, hit, hit the bar. Um, okay. All right. I'm seeing... Uh, I'm seeing this now. Oh, it looks like the slide numbers are a little different. Okay. Um, so hit your bar. This is, uh, I think, the last thing that I was talking about, which was the, uh, the difference in capital costs um, for plants with and without capture across three different uh, technologies. Uh, if you hit the bar again, there should be a pop-up uh, that says uh, what um, uh, I had mentioned earlier, that costs were significantly higher. And uh, in the next slide uh, is, is a possible explanation for why uh, these costs have uh, increased over the last decade. Uh, this is a, uh, a schematic of a typical uh, capital cost outlook trend as technologies uh, leave the early stages of research and development and uh, come into the demonstration and early commercialization and subsequent uh, 
diffusion uh, stages. Um, to hit the bar again, I think where we have been over the past decade is kind of in that uh, area shown by uh, the dotted line. That is, uh, we have entered the stage of uh, commercialization and deployment at scale, uh, and as uh, technologies become uh, closer to reality at those scales, uh, there are typical cost increases due to uh, additional design changes and a number of uh, uh, factors that tend to uh, increase the costs of early deployments relative to more optimistic uh, estimates uh, when fewer details are available. Uh, so our, our take is that we're probably currently uh, right around that peak. We now have uh, a couple of full-scale installations uh, and uh, that uh, is our best uh, explanation for what we see in, in uh, capital costs over the uh, last decade. So we should be at around the peak and hopefully coming down with more plans are deployed. Next slide, then, Sean. Yeah. So in the previous set, <clears throat> I, I had run through a set of uh, bar graphs similar to this one for capital costs. Uh, so uh, in this slide, we're making similar comparisons for the levelized cost of electricity. And this slide focuses first on uh, simply on supercritical uh, PC plants. So now we're combining capital costs with OEM and fuel costs and other factors to get a levelized cost of electricity. Uh, as in the previous slides, which I guess you haven't seen, uh, they kind of look like this. The first uh, set of bars uh, on the left represent the original uh, special report in 2002 dollars. The middle bars represent uh, the same values adjusted to 2013 dollars. Uh, and the last bars on the right uh, represent the results of the more recent studies uh, we reviewed. Um, and if you hit the bar once, you'll see first um, something analogous to what I said, but apparently you must not have seen in the previous slide, is if we look at the special report, uh, the levelized cost of plants uh, with capture uh, were about 56% higher than the reference plants without capture. Uh, in the more recent studies, uh, and again, uh, that value has uh, Sean, hit the uh, bar one more time. There should be another pop-up. There it is. 62%. Uh, Again, the, the difference is uh, somewhat uh, higher relative to uh, recent plants without capture. Um, however, it's also interesting now if we compare uh, the two green bars, plants with capture now and 10 years ago, or the two blue bars, uh, we find actually uh, a, a, a slight decrease. Uh, hit the bar again, Sean. There should be a pop-up <coughs> that uh, shows the uh, levelized cost of electricity is actually uh, somewhat lower now uh, for both uh, for plants, both with and without capture, uh, on uh, on an adjusted basis. Um, and the reason for that. Uh, next slide is some of the factors that uh, Howard mentioned earlier, some of the differences uh, in assumptions that go into these cost studies. So while capital costs have gone up over the last decades, two other critical factors that go into the levelized cost of electricity um, have changed in directions that offset. Uh, back up one more. Again, let's get that last one. Uh, uh, that go into that. Uh, those two assumptions are the uh, levelized capacity factor uh, and the cost of capital. Over the last decade, interest rates, uh, both in the U.S. and in most of the world, have declined. So the cost of capital, uh, in general, in recent studies, has been lower than in uh, the studies 10 years ago. Uh, but what is especially important are the assumptions in a lot of the recent studies by DOE, Yepri, and others uh, that um, going forward, future plants uh, effectively will be discharged whenever they are available. So we see relatively high capacity factors, typically uh, 80 85% uh, 
which uh, represents the assumption that over the 30-year uh, uh, operating life of these plants, uh, they will be uh, fully utilized to that extent. Historically, that has not been the case. Uh, actual utilization uh, has typically been lower than availability. Uh, so assumptions about uh, the uh, utilization of plants going forward plays a critical role in levelized cost uh, calculations. Now let's go to the next slide, which shows uh, again the LCOE comparisons across uh, the three different technologies that we've been following. Uh, so again, for supercritical PC plants, uh, there is essentially no change in uh, LCOE values between recent studies and uh, the IPCC study. Uh, the bar, I think there's a little pop-up that will uh, summarize some of these numbers. There it is. Uh, and uh, smaller changes uh, for uh, gasification and combined cycle systems. So again, what we see is assumptions about capacity factor and cost of capital uh, offsetting the effects of increased capital costs. Uh, next slide. So, so far we've been talking just about the capture system uh, at the plant. As Howard mentioned, in the IPCC study there were separate um, chapters and separate looks at the costs of capture, transport, and storage, and then we combined all three. Uh, we also looked at more recent studies for transport and storage costs. Uh, summary conclusions are that for <coughs> typical onshore pipelines, at least in uh, the U.S., costs uh, are very similar to the special report costs when uh, they are adjusted for a common basis. Basically, it says we uh, have a lot of experience in building pipelines, their cost of building stable. Some of the European uh, studies that we compared actually showed <coughs> somewhat higher costs, especially for uh, pipelines carrying smaller amounts of, uh, of CO2, typically the amount of uh, CO2 that might be captured in a single plant. At uh, larger rates that the networks, uh, those costs were a bit more stable. Uh, the next bullet uh, will show uh, Sean, the uh, summary of uh, geologic storage costs. <coughs> Again, for geologic storage, uh, the cost ranges uh, uh, have shifted. Uh, so that says over the last decade, uh, as we've learned more about uh, the costs involved in, uh, in permitting and operating a storage site, uh, those costs have uh, generally uh, increased, especially at the low end of the cost range. The high end of the cost range is not too much different, slightly higher. Uh, the major shift has been at the low end of the cost range. Uh, the other qualitative difference is that in recent studies, uh, when oil prices internationally have been high, uh, assumed credits for enhanced oil recovery also have been substantially higher uh, than they were uh, in the earlier study uh, 10 years ago. Next bullet is, um, hit the next one then, Sean. There we go. Uh, this next slide then uh, compares the overall uh, LCOE, including capture, transport, uh, and storage. Uh, this is a comparison similar to the one Howard showed earlier from the special report. Uh, so we're showing two cases, the first set of numbers in the white bar cases without EOR, and uh, the uh, numbers in the blue bar underneath that are with EOR credits. Uh, if you hit that space bar again, what we find generally, if you look carefully at the range, is that uh, roughly, roughly these LCO ranges uh, are unchanged on an adjusted cost basis. There are some increases. Uh, for uh, especially for natural gas combined size and IGCC plants. Uh, <clears throat> but the ranges are fairly wide. They range over uh, many cases a factor of two uh, and are not all that different because of the offsetting factors that we talked about earlier. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide shows similar data for the mitigation cost, the cost of CO2 avoided 
Uh, if you hit the bar again, there uh, is a conclusion that, again, uh, roughly uh, these cost ranges uh, are similar in recent studies to what, what they were earlier. But again, uh, these ranges are, uh, are substantially uh, uh, wide. There have been some decreases uh, for uh, post-combustion systems, uh, but <coughs> given the broad range, they're, uh, they're, they're roughly similar. Again, two offsetting sets of, uh, of factors. Uh, next slide. Um, a couple of other conclusions. Uh, first uh, is, uh, as Howard mentioned earlier, uh, we look more carefully in uh, this paper at oxycombustion systems, uh, which have undergone substantial development over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, our conclusion there is that uh, oxycombustion systems do show potential to be cost effective and cost competitive with post-combustion capture uh, for new supercritical plants based on 90% uh, capture. Most of the studies of oxy systems have focused on uh, low-rate coal, subbituminous, and lignite, where uh, they have uh, a more uh, noticeable advantage uh, in terms of cost. Uh, next bullet uh, is our uh, kind of bottom line takeaway is that across the four systems that we looked at, uh, there are no obvious uh, winners or losers. That's kind of the, the critical uh, message. Uh, ITCC, well, if the other three has lost a bit of ground over the past decade, its costs have generally will systematically crept up a bit relative to uh, other systems. Uh, but again, uh, not to the extent that uh, any of these options would, would be ruled out given uh, the variety of situations in which they might uh, might be deployed. If we go to the next slide, um, just a quick word about the outlook for, uh, for future cost reductions. Uh, there have been a number of uh, studies. If we go to the next slide first. Um, uh, I'm showing you here some results from uh, some recent studies by uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, the National Energy Technology Lab, uh, using what uh, we call a bottom-up analysis, where they hypothesize a, uh, a flow sheet with cost analysis of, of a uh, appliance system. Uh, if you hit the uh, bar again, uh, the results of these studies uh, suggest that uh, a variety of technical improvements that uh, are uh, foreseeable uh, would result in uh, roughly 20 to 30 percent reductions in uh, the levelized cost of electricity due to uh, technological advances, uh, assuming, and this is a key assumption, assuming that uh, the uh, research and development goals of DOE uh, are, are fully met. Uh, the next slide shows similar results for gasification-based systems. Again, if you hit the bar there, uh, these are systems that are typically starting from a higher current cost, uh, but uh, DOE at least foresees reductions of 30 to 40 percent in their cost of electricity if R&D goals are met. Uh, so uh, there's not a timeline associated with these. Uh, estimates. They are not projections. They are uh, what would result in what they are estimated to be is uh, the cost that would result if, again, if R&D goals are met and if current cost estimates are, uh, are in fact what would be realized in the future. Uh, the next slide shows one final comparison from uh, a different type of study, a so-called top-down analysis as opposed to a bottom-up analysis. Uh, top-down analysis is one that typically uses a large-scale energy environment uh, model to look at climate, often climate uh, mitigation scenarios in which there are requirements for carbon reductions. Uh, these are some results from uh, one of uh, those uh, uh, studies a few years ago <coughs> that suggest uh, that costs could come down substantially uh, given uh, the deployment of uh, carbon capture technologies that would result from increasingly higher uh, carbon prices. So again, 
uh, there is a strong policy driver here that's driving deployment and the cost reductions uh, come about from the use of historical learning curves uh, for technologies that are similar to uh, CMP capture technologies. Uh, next slide uh, is uh, our, uh, essentially our, our wrap up, what does it take to achieve these cost reductions? Uh, what comes across clearly from the literature and experience is um, three things are needed. Sustained R&D, uh, certainly, uh, but uh, equally critical, uh, more critical in many <coughs> respects, is the learning one gets from the experience of actually building and operating full-scale uh, facilities. Uh, in order for that to happen, uh, strong policy drivers that effectively create markets for CCS technologies are needed. Combinations of carrots and sticks, incentives and uh, requirements uh, in various forms uh, are uh, still uh, the order of the day in order to see future cost reductions that would come from markets and future deployment. So if we hit the space bar one more time, uh, just a reminder to stay tuned for updates. We'll be continuing to follow these developments through the uh, cost network and, and other research. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we can uh, stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, try to handle any questions if you have any. Next slide, I think is just the, uh, just to make sure I have that one right. <laughs> it's just, thank you. Uh, these are our email addresses again, so you can uh, contact us if you have any uh, 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 requests that we can't handle right now. Uh, we can forget the additional information or perhaps just go directly to questions if you have any. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much to uh, Howard Herzog and Ed Rubin for that illuminating pre presentation on CCS cost trends and outlook. We apologize to, uh, to uh, uh, um, listeners for the technical glitch midway through. However, that was indeed an excellent presentation on the way costs have changed over the past decade, the outlook for future CCS costs, and what needs to be done to achieve reductions in those costs. And we have indeed had a uh, uh, had some questions, so I will uh, read them out, uh, Howard and Ed, if you would like to um, uh, respond to them. So the First question was a, uh, a sort of a, a general one on the presentation, uh, where it says the focus seems to be on coal-fired power generation. Is there any work on capture from uh, on, on cost from industrial sources? It's felt that representing the cost uh, uh, for for power generation as the cost of CCS could tend to do an injustice to uh, many industrial sources. Um, I can try to respond to that. Uh, um, yes, so we should have we should have prefaced uh, this talk um, with the comment that we are focused on power generation <coughs> simply because that is where uh, most of the effort and most of the analyses that we are trying to summarize uh, has been. Uh, that said, the special report uh, 10 years ago uh, did include a look at a variety of industrial sources. Um, the literature at that time was uh, fairly sparse, uh, but it covered a number of, um, of operations where carbon capture occurs as part of the normal process, such as in manufacturing hydrogen and other chemicals, as well as uh, a few other industrial sources uh, where carbon capture would have to be added, like uh, steel and uh, uh, cement production. Uh, we did not attempt in this study to review any of the more recent literature on industrial sources. Um, we, we looked at it carefully enough, I think, to be able to safely say the following is that um, there is wide variability across cost estimates for uh, industrial sources, depending largely on the type of application uh, and process we're talking about. Uh, there are still industries where costs are relatively low. Those tend to be in operations where 
Uh, CO2 separation is already needed as part of the manufacturing process. Uh, and other applications uh, where costs are relatively high, comparable to and often higher than those we see at power plants. Uh, a lot of variability, so uh, it, uh, it was not within the purview of what we uh, were asked to do or tried to do uh, in this study. But um, uh, there is that literature, and uh, perhaps that's uh, uh, the next thing we might try to tackle in, uh, in the cost network. I will just add that we had we have had sessions on uh, industrial cost at some of the uh, cost network meetings, um, That's right. yeah. but but it's 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 much harder to generalize uh, in the way you do for power plants because of the variability. Okay, uh, thank you, gentlemen. Um, now, in the presentation, you mentioned that costs tend to increase when a technology enters a demonstration phase. Did you compare the nth of a kind cost of CO2 capture, uh, CCS, as presented in many literature studies with costs presented in feed studies and or demonstration projects? If so, how much uh, 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 have, have the cost increased? Yeah, you want to look at how? Say it again. You want me to start? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I, once again, we, um, in fact, we we've dedicated one of our uh, cross network meetings to that exact same issue. Um, the the problem uh, there's a couple problems in trying to answer it uh, very quantitatively. First, uh, uh, a lot of information uh, is is not out there on on the uh, demonstration projects. Uh, uh, to, to compare directly, and especially uh, uh, what you see in the in the literature studies are looking at CCS systems. When you look at these real projects, there's other costs that may be thrown in uh, that that are non-CCS related, such as substation upgrades and, and, and things like that. So it it's um, it, it's hard to do it, but we can say specifically uh, uh, the cost of these. Um, demonstration projects are significantly higher than, than the cost in, in some of these uh, studies and uh, that's to be expected um, you know uh, I, I don't want to throw out any quantitative numbers because we I haven't and, I, and uh, we haven't really systematically uh, uh, sat down and um, uh, try try to do it I don't know of any uh, study that's done that. Um, but uh, they are uh, significantly larger. Uh, uh, I, I guess throughout, uh, they could be as, as much as a factor of two higher. In some yeah, cases, uh, maybe even more. What, one example, uh, for, for those of you who are interested in that, uh, let me uh, point you to the proceedings of our most recent workshop uh, earlier this year. Um, one of the uh, very useful contributions actually came uh, from the folks at the SASC Power uh, when we asked them uh, to try to talk about as much as they could share publicly uh, the factors that uh, accounted for uh, the difference in their actual cost versus what one might find in some of the literature studies. Uh, <clears throat> so they actually contributed a couple of slides and a little walkthrough of factors that uh, actually did a very uh, nice job of uh, shedding some, some understanding on that. Uh, in their case, it was factors like plant size. They had a 100 megawatt facility, uh, which did not have the benefits of economies of scale that you find at 500 or 600 megawatts. Uh, they were using a low rank coal, which had higher costs. They were dealing with a lot of first of a kind issues, uh, shortages of uh, skilled labor, a number of factors that when one tries to account for them quantitatively, um, actually uh, can explain very uh, reasonably why those costs were higher than what one would assume if it were a different type of, uh, uh, of facility. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the point that Howard mentioned about the lack of availability of details of these feed studies that the questioner asked about, uh, we would like very much to get inside of many of these to actually try to figure that out more, more carefully. 
um, as that information eventually becomes available, we can perhaps do that. But uh, the couple of looks we've taken and others have taken um, uh, at site-specific factors as opposed to generic cost estimates, uh, a lot of that can be accounted for if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. I'll just add one more thing. In some of these feed studies that are put out, even though there's a lot of information there, the real nitty-gritty on cost is usually uh, uh, not presented because it's, it's considered uh, proprietary information of the company. So, yeah. so it is, it is a bit frustrating if you really want to get down into the real nitty-gritty uh, from these feed studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Now, um, we have had quite a few questions coming through, but we're just going to take one last question now, and then we will note the remaining questions and get a response back to you on, the, uh, on those remaining questions uh, later. But uh, we will uh, now just take this last question for, uh, for uh, Howard and Ed. So the question is, you are showing that the cost estimates are now similar to those from 2005 once indexed. But are you suggesting that these then are around the actual cost? What is your expectation of the learning curve effect? Um, let, me, let me see if I can uh, uh, try to um, uh, answer that one. Uh, again, the reason uh, those costs are comparable, that's the levelized cost of electricity numbers. Those are the ones that are comparable and the mitigation costs that flow from that. Uh, and the reason those are comparable, it, as we've said before, is that uh, <coughs> two issues are off offsetting each other. Capital costs have gone up. It's probably a more robust um, uh, finding, <laughs> but assumptions about uh, the future costs of uh, capital and the degree of utilization of plants, which are admittedly fuzzier because you're uh, trying to project what will happen over the future life, uh, those have become much more favorable and uh, quantitatively <coughs> Uh, those two factors have roughly offset each other. The change in fuel prices for natural gas has been another factor uh, in, in, that, in that case. The typical learning curve uh, 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 estimates that we and others have looked at tend to focus on capital costs and have learning curves for O&M costs as well, but most of the focus is on, on capital costs. Uh, obviously, we won't know for sure until uh, a few more facilities are actually built, and that capital cost data is shared and, and critiqued uh, where we are on that learning curve. But um, I personally have every expectation that with sufficient deployment, we would see for CCS the same types of learning behavior that we've seen for uh, SO2 scrubbers, SCR, automobile catalysts, a whole set of technologies uh, which, when deployed at scale with a sufficient experience base, uh, given other factors that are held constant, like cost of raw materials, which is unavoidable, um, we do see learning consistently, and uh, we have every expectation that we would see it here. The qualitative feedback from uh, Boundary Dam that many of you have uh, heard before, and we've uh, heard similar reports from some of the other earlier demonstration programs is uh, if I had to build another one, I already know how to make it 20% or 30% uh, cheaper than, uh, than this first of a kind. So I would be very optimistic about the potential for learning given uh, a uh, sufficiently strong incentive that causes these things uh, to deploy it. Without that, uh, there is no learning. Okay, well, I think it's time to wrap up now. Uh, this was really a, a first-rate session. Before we go, I'd like to thank again our two excellent speakers and real authorities on these matters, Howard Herzog and Ed Rubin. And finally, a big thank you to you, the audience. Please keep your eyes open for our next webinar. Until then, goodbye.